Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's BSEC webinar at which we are partnering with the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for the United Kingdom. This year has for many of us been very challenging. The British Swedish Chamber of Commerce has kept supporting our members via our digital events by sharing knowledge, promoting our members and introducing and referring members. And uh, if you miss an event, we are sharing presentations, summaries, and frequently also recordings of the webinars via our website and social media platform. And we really aim with these webinars to give our members and cooperation partners a solid foundation and a platform to discuss presumptions for the future development of the world. And we, um, we hope that these webinars will be interactive. So we rely on you all to ask your questions. And before I hand over to our distinguished panel and our moderator uh, this afternoon, I would like to underline quickly some housekeeping rules. Please do all keep yourself on mute. Um, we uh, ask you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for your questions. Please do write them there during the presentations. And this event will be recorded. And if you have any issues with digital or tech issues, do email Emil Kjellqvist. So the world as we know it has changed dramatically during 2020. And we will most certainly keep, uh, and it will most certainly keep doing so during the years to come. At the end of the transition period, with only 17 days to go, businesses are waiting for the decision on future trade terms after the EU exit. Businesses now really, really need clarity. And uh, how will the changing rules and circumstances for trade impact the relationship between Sweden and the UK? And how will the changes differ across industries? I am so very glad to welcome our distinguished panel this afternoon. Um, and it will be led by our chairman, Tom Johnston, who will also speak on the panel representing the views of global industry and bilateral trade. Thank you so much, very much, everyone. And thank you, Tom. And I will hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Christina, uh, both for that uh, introduction and also for the excellent job you and the team are doing. Just now, it's, as you say, it's been a challenging environment, but using this technique, we've been able to run even more events this year than we normally did. So thank you so much, Christina, to you and the team, and to also all our patrons and members for their support uh, during the year. Very valuable, very much appreciated, and we hope you found them, uh, all the events we've run really beneficial. Uh, this event uh, that we set up, we set up at a time when we thought we would be in a position of discussing the agreed deal between the uh, EU and the UK and, and discussing its implications, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, they were in, as it said, the last mile uh, there, which is also very good that they called it the last mile and not the last kilometer. So it shows the leaning and to try and keep us closer together with that. Um, I want to welcome you all to this event and particularly a warm welcome to our three uh, uh, my three panelists and three main speakers, uh, the Ambassador Judy Goff, who I'll come to in just a few minutes, to Nicholas Mortensen from Stena, and to Jan Olsen uh, from Deutsche Bank. Fantastic each of you could, could join uh, and, and give us your different perspectives on what's going on. As Christina mentioned, this year has been a challenging year. We always have the old Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times, but really there's no doubt this is really, really interesting times. And as I look at the news today, I see three things dominating the news. First of all, the presidential situation uh, across the water in the USA, uh, and, and not just the result of the election, because that's fairly clear, but all the implications round about that for the democracy. Secondly, of course, the pandemic and its implication on societies, on people, and of course, on, on, on business uh, and how we're addressing that and how we're moving move, moving forward. And finally, of course, the EU exit and, and, and what that means uh, for the future relationship between EU and the UK. I mean, EU and UK have been long, close trading partners for, for many, many years. 
And that will continue in the future. It doesn't mean an end to it. It will continue absolutely in the future, but it will continue in a different way. And this trade deal, um, it's probably no surprise that we're still working to sort it out because it is a big, it is a very, very important trade deal. It's a trade deal that is of great importance, not just to the UK and the people in the UK, but for all of us in the EU and for us in Sweden, due to a strong relationship between Sweden um, and the UK. And it's very unlike other trade deals because many of the other trade deals that are made are about companies, uh, sorry, countries coming closer together. The EU-UK um, uh, trade deal, I'm not saying it's about moving apart, but it's more about setting up restrictions and ways and how to do things, still with the intention to have a strong relationship. So really it's a, it's a, a very interesting one and probably no surprise that we're, we're, we're still where we are. I think the important thing and the positive thing that came over the weekend is that we're still talking. That's really, really positive. I think nobody, well, let's just say very few people want no deal. No deal is not good for the UK. It's not good for us in Europe. So we want a deal uh, to come out of this and a deal that will help, I hope, continue the relationship, maybe even strengthen the relationship in many ways. I'll come back later with some thoughts on that from an uh, uh, industry viewpoint, business viewpoint from my side there. But we've got fantastic panelists who can give their inputs on trade, on finance, but also in the overview of, of the situation. So with that, I'd like to start by, by going into the, our first speaker. Um, and, and really, I'm delighted the ambassador could take the time to be here with us and, uh, and uh, give us her input as to what's happening at the moment, realizing that <laughs> it's probably changing as she is speaking to us at the moment, as the negotiations go on going. Delighted to have you here, uh, uh, Ambassador Judith. So please, can I hand over to you to give your introductory remarks and some comments in your perspective and how you see things and how you see things uh, going forward. The one thing I would say is we all know EUX is going to happen. We just don't know under which terms at the moment there. Maybe you can send a little bit more light from your inside view. Over to you, uh, Judith. Uh, Tom, Christina, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me uh, this afternoon. And of course, if we're talking miles, I, I wonder actually whether we were talking about a Swedish mile, uh, which we all know is a damn sight longer uh, than a British mile, but nevertheless. Um, when I accepted this invitation to speak uh, on the panel, uh, I think like everybody else, I thought we would have a very clear destination at set. Uh, and that on the 14th of December uh, 2020, uh, we would uh, know a lot more than we uh, know now. Uh, and Tom is absolutely right. Uh, it's an extremely busy period at the moment. Um, and the negotiations are still going as we speak. I have to check Twitter as I say that, just in case something has actually happened over the last 10 minutes whilst I've been dialed onto this call. Uh, but it really is a very dynamic situation. And I think what can we take from that? Uh, I mean, firstly, you're absolutely right. Um, the fact that the negotiation can, no, negotiations continue is a good sign. Uh, and there is a determination, uh, certainly on the British side, uh, to leave no stone unturned in trying to get a deal. Uh, I think the Prime Minister is absolutely serious uh, about trying to, to get something out of this. Um, that being said, um, there are still significant difficulties uh, between the two sides, uh, level playing field um, and, and fish being the two uh, most uh, significant. Now it's so dynamic uh, that I think there have been some shifts today. I'm not gonna go into the details of those uh, because I think one of the key things is that there's an awful lot being reported uh, that doesn't necessarily always uh, bear out in reality. But I think the sense from the prime minister uh, and David Frost and the team is that the EU has underestimated uh, just how serious uh, they are in terms of what they mean by sovereignty for the UK uh, and what they mean for independence for the UK going forwards and the UK's ability to make its own decisions. And I think that comes out uh, in the so-called level playing field where the UK does not want to be bound, for example, by future changes to EU regulation that then we would be bound to implement into British law. So there's some still quite significant differences uh, there. I think what we can say, regardless of whether we have knowledge of the outcome at this stage or not, is that we know things are going to change on the 1st of January. Uh, that is a certain. 
uh, and we know that there will be more friction in the trading relationship between the UK and the European Union, between the UK uh, and Sweden. There is no doubt about that. Uh, again, we don't have the full and final details. That will depend on what is agreed, uh, but we know the friction uh, will be there, additional bureaucracy. Um, I think it's very uh, important to also remember um, that you know this has been an extremely long road, an extremely long journey. Um, nonetheless, uh, our relationship with the European Union and Sweden uh, is of fundamental importance, uh, and that will continue uh, going forwards. And I want to be you know to stress that uh, the relationships, uh, the trading relationships, really, really matter to us. My prediction is that Q1 2021 is going to be quite difficult. Um, we, we've got two things here. One is uh, an, an end to the transition period, which does come to an end on the 31st of December. Uh, the second is the fact that actually trade flows uh, and business is being hampered by COVID. Uh, and in the UK, we are in the midst um, of a significant outbreak. Uh, the same is true in Sweden, unfortunately, as well. And so I think we will see two different effects. Uh, and when we talk about economic impacts, perhaps later on, it will be, I think, important to realise that not only um, uh, are we dealing with EU exit, but actually that COVID has had a significant impact on the UK's economy this year. GDP has contracted by over 11%. That is almost unprecedented uh, and hugely significant. Um, in terms of what we have been trying to do here in Sweden, um, obviously, uh, my embassy team and I are fully aware of Swedish sentiment on EU exit. Uh, we know it's not the outcome that Sweden would have chosen, uh, and we know that the level of ambition in that trade agreement is not what Sweden uh, would have chosen. Um, but um, I, I think what is absolutely clear is that we and Sweden both share a strong determination to work together in every uh, interaction that I've had with the Swedish government over the past year since I have been here and in this job, it has been very clear that the goodwill is still strong and the intention to make this work going forwards is very, very strong. Um, we may um, have our relationship currently defined by our membership of the European Union. Um, we've been trading for over a thousand years. We've had diplomatic relations for over 500 years. We've only defined our relationship for the past 25 through the European Union. Our relationship goes much broader and deeper than this. Uh, and that includes our defense relationship, our security relationship, how we act together as a force for good in the world and how like-minded we are on so many issues. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. And that makes me in the mid to longer term, very optimistic for the relationship between the UK and Sweden because the fundamentals are there and the fundamentals are very good. What we have been trying to do as an embassy is to make sure that we are as prepared as possible. Um, we have been working very hard uh, with business in Sweden with the Swedish government, with the agencies to be as ready as we can, albeit that we still have a degree of uncertainty out there. I think there have been some really good success stories out of this, and it's really important to remember that actually some things have worked exceptionally well. So if I look at the withdrawal agreement and freedom of movement in the UK, we've had four and a half million EU citizens apply for settled status. 4.3 million of those applications have been processed. That's quite astounding, particularly when you think of it having been done uh, during the corona. Uh, time. Now, we think about 30,000 Swedes have now got their settled status. Um, for those of you tuning into this call, we want more. Um, we believe there are 100,000 Swedes in the UK. We want to encourage everybody who is there that wants to stay in the UK to apply for that settled status. Um, and I think that has been so far a, a good success story. The flip side to that is that the Swedish system now has its own process for British nationals here in Sweden, which opened uh, very, very recently. Uh, so there is uh, some real practical operational um, progress that has been made as a result of this, but obviously uh, there is much more to do uh, going forwards. So I think I will stop there. As I say, uh, a far greater degree of uncertainty than I thought they would be uh, in what I'm able uh, to tell you today. Happy to answer questions. Um, undoubtedly, uh, I say in, in Q1 next year, uh, we will see friction. We will be uh, trying to uh, problem solve and troubleshoot, but I remain optimistic that actually we will get through that period. And once we get through the spring, COVID vaccines come online, the, the days get longer, uh, and the understanding of the bureaucracy and the red tape uh, becomes broader, I think we will be in a much better position uh, and we will have much greater clarity and much more optimism about the way forwards. Thank you. 
Thank you so so very much uh, for that. And uh, and I share with you the views that the relationship has been long standing pre EU and um, between our two countries, between Sweden. I say our two countries as a Scotsman here living in Sweden. Uh, between our two countries, and I do think it will continue absolutely uh, going forward once we get a little bit more clarity. With that, I'd like to uh, pass over to to Nicholas. Nicholas. Uh, um, you are uh, very uh, heavily involved in the UK with your operations there as well and, and, and have a perspective on trade and uh, other matters. Please, Nicholas, share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and thank you very much, Tom, as well. Well, yes, I'm representing the ferry company Stenaline, and um, not so many people, I assume, think that we actually or know that we do have roughly 50% of our business and revenue goes to and from UK and just underline in, in, in this, with this audience is that we do not have a direct line from Sweden over to UK, but um, we are heavily involved in all the trades going to and from UK. Um, we're not only a shipping line uh, because we also own a couple of ports, like six ports around uh, the North Sea and the Irish Sea, both in UK, Ireland and, and Holland as well. So I think we, we are in some way, uh, well, after Q1 or after Q2, we actually know exactly what we should have done before, uh, because we both have trades going from, if you excuse me calling it the central part of Europe, from Holland over to UK. Then we have continuing from UK back to Europe, in other words, Republic of Ireland. Then we have domestic routes going from Northern Ireland to Scotland and to England. And then we also have a direct route from, from the Republic of Ireland to Wales, as well as a direct route going from the Republic of Ireland, bypassing UK and over to France. So we have all the answers afterwards here, uh, just looking into which will be the, the right trade um, part to, to go. So um, what we are doing right now is really to securing that we are going through a transition as smooth as possible. We are all waiting for the day to come where we have the answer what, what the agreement will look like. Um, we will be, as well as the UK citizens, very dependent on what kind of trade deal we're ending up with. Will there be an EU trade deal or will it be the WTO uh, trade deal? And if it's the later one, of course, that will create bottlenecks for all of us. Um, I think mostly what we will see is some kind of reduced consumption because everything will be uh, more expensive in UK and reduced consumption also means reduced transportation. And we as a shipping company, we are a integrated part of the European infrastructure. That means that we do not only see us as a shipping route, we are actually uh, accommodating the trade flows in EU and therefore we are very easily we can measure where the flow goes right now and we can see that there is a huge stockpiling three weeks back and I just talked to my colleague today over in London and and he says that people in London today are shopping like all shops will be closed tomorrow and it's just tremendously how they are emptying the, the, the stores right now. And um, that is of course for good and bad because potentially what we see as a pickup before Brexit, it's volumes that we expected to have in January. So we have double volumes now. And as ambassador said, Q1 will be really struggling quarter for all of us. Um, we are right now in a position where we are as ready as possible. And I think it's important to say nobody can be 100% ready because we do not really know what to, to be ready for. Um, but we are as ready as possible. And there it's been really consuming time when it's coming to IT systems. And we are still in a trial and error between the customs in UK, Republic of Ireland and Holland as well. And um, 
those days just before Christmas would be the last day where we really test the system. So for all of you there having import and export to UK, I would say that um, the majority of all suppliers are as ready as possible, but nobody can for sure say that we are done. Um, and um, there is a lot of work to be done still. Um, when it's coming to the most important part for a shipping company like us and, and for our important customers, in this case, mostly transport transportation companies, it is of course to reduce administration and also to reduce time waiting in the ports. And as far as we can see right now, because everything is so uh, sensitive for delays in the European supply chains. And as far as we can see now, the UK government has done their utmost when it's coming to be prepared to reduce the waiting time in the ports. And there is also, and that has not really been mentioned in Sweden, I think, a transition period where there will be a kind of ease up the first six months. So I think our biggest worries from a port perspective and waiting time is not the six first months. It's from the 1st of July, have everything really be sorted then, because then there is no time to wait after that one. And then of course, reduce waiting time and reduced administration means uh, integrated IT system that we are working heavily with right now. And I, I would say that we are prepared together with the UK government uh, for something we don't really know what to prepare for. Um, and, and that is, of course, there is a lot of anxiety in the system right now with all stakeholders involved here. Um, but I mean, from a standard perspective, yes, this will be some kind of challenges, but we still believe that um, we are um, positive or, or looking forward to the future as well, because we have done huge investments in UK during this year. Uh, and the last one and a half year, we have done ship and port investments for roughly 400 million pounds. So of course we do believe in the future and there are still 60, 70 million people in UK who wants to continue eating and, and, and entertain them and, and, and purchasing things as well. Uh, potentially a small uh, V curve after the COVID, but we know to handle those V curves nowadays and I'm sure we can handle one more in this case. Uh, but of course, the combination with Brexit and the COVID uh, puts a lot of pressure on everybody involved. And I think this is one of the hardest year to predict and forecast how it will look like. Um, we can just be working together as we're doing with our customers and the government and other stakeholders and just reduce the number of bottlenecks as quick and easy uh, because we all have the same kind of goal that life continues also after COVID and Brexit. So uh, I think I, I stop there uh, for the moment and waiting for questions or discussions. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed, uh, Nicholas. And I must say, very positive news to hear you say that uh, a lot of things are, are in place, even if we don't know what they'll be used for, uh, mm. which is very important. Maybe I'll come back to you a little bit later on the question. Yeah. We focus a lot on the UK government being ready and UK ports being ready to handle it. Are European ports equally as ready to handle it the other way around about for goods coming out? We'll come back to that maybe a little bit later as a question. If that's because okay. I have a clear answer there, Tom. So I'm, I'm delighted to answer that one. <laughs> I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. I'll come back on that one. It, it, the financial market is a very, very important uh, part of the UK economy, financial services, which I know are outside of the deal, et cetera. But, uh, but Jan, please give us your perspective, both from the finance side, but maybe also in, in your role as chair of SCC, what, what you're hearing a little bit more and, and what you, how you see that affecting your members uh, in the UK. So if I pass over to you, Jan, please. Yeah, Tom, Tom, thank you very much for that introduction. So yes, um, I represent uh, Deutsche Bank and the Swedish Chamber of Commerce here. And um, the first comment I would like to make is that the financial markets here in London are huge. I mean, it's one of the absolute premier global centers globally. And the daily trade is internationalism. We live in an international society. Finance is international. And Brexit nor anything else will stop 
the international flow of capital and the developments that we are seeing right now. So in my view, the international trend, despite Brexit, will continue. We live in a capital markets world where um, the capital markets determine often the financing of companies, both on the debt and the equity markets. We see IPOs, that is listing of companies, and all these transactions are what I will, would call super international. Investors come from all corners of the world and all nationalities are presented and represented. So that will not stop with a Brexit movement. It will rather continue and probably be even more international in the future. And, um, and that means we need international talent. We need international individuals in London from all nationalities. So it's a true meritocracy where um, individuals are recruited from all corners of the world and all sort of um, edu educational backgrounds and institutions. It's very diverse. And I think that cannot be stopped by um, a political movement. Maybe temporarily there will be some changes, but in the long run, this trend will continue as it has in the past, it will in the future. In my opinion, the EU needs the UK and vice versa, the UK needs the EU. That is very, very important. Both parties need each other and London as a financial center is so important for the EU that it will continue to strive. <coughs> now, we're talking a lot about EU, UK and we've done that now for four years, but um, London is much more than EU, UK. It's a global financial center and we're competing here for um, resources and that's financial resources with, with countries such as the United States, Asia, regions such as Asia. And that's very much part of the daily activities here. So we don't wake up here in London and think only about Europe, but we think about primarily what the markets have done in Asia when we wake up here, and then it goes on to New York. And that will continue, in my opinion, very much so. So the flow of funds, the stock markets and so on, live of internationalism, and that's what we do here in the financial markets too. We're seeing major transactions here, even in the, in the midst of Brexit here. We're seeing AstraZeneca, one of the largest um, UK, Swedish um, companies, and they're involved in almost a $40 billion trade here over the weekend and an acquisition in the United States. And we will continue to see more of these deals. And that means that these companies believe in the future and they believe in the international aspects of business. So that's something that I see will continue. Um, in terms of more specifics, what I see here, just on if we go away from these global trends, of course, um, there is, um, with Brexit, come the issues of passporting, traveling, selling products in Europe, and so on. That's a little bit the microcosm that we deal in today, uh, deal with today. Um, I think it will all solve itself. Nobody has the vision to say exactly today where this will lead and how passporting will be solved, what financial services we can sell in Europe and how. But as a matter of fact, um, I live and breathe the financial markets here. Very few individuals have actually transferred to other countries out of the city of London. I mean, the sort of population that has moved is minute so far. And in my opinion, it will somehow solve itself. There will be no major movements of people and so on, because uh, we, we live now with um, information technology, airports and so on are accessible. So I think this uh, will continue in the way it has in the past with some minor changes. What we're seeing is also, as with COVID, we're seeing certain trends that are enforced by the um, current dynamics in the world. For example, with COVID, the technology trend that was always there before, but it was maybe this, it's as speeded up. And so we see a little bit the movement of people. There are many reasons why people are moving to Paris, Frankfurt, and other European cities, Madrid, and so on, and Stockholm also, for that matter. And, um, and that will continue. But that's not just because of Brexit. There are other reasons for that often, too. And then um, another important aspect in this sort of daily um, life is, of course, regulation and how that will change. In my opinion, it's important for the financial markets that we move towards one regulated market in Europe. I know that's a radical statement here because there are a lot of issues to be solved even within the EU to do that. 
But if we're competing against sort of um, major countries and blocks like Asia, the United States and so on, Europe needs uh, the free flow of the capital and the regulatory framework that makes it easy to do, do business across uh, national borders and also financial services business across national borders. So that's something I see. Then in terms of the Chamber of Commerce that I chair here in the UK, we have actually seen an increase of members here um, over there. And that's and something goes, that goes totally against public opinion and the trend. So we are seeing a thriving community in the Chamber of Commerce. We're seeing um, lots of companies that are interested in our activities and a membership that's thriving and growing. So those are some of the issues that we are seeing and that people believe in the UK. And yes, Brexit is an important topic, but a lot of the companies that are members also say we have to look into the future and we have to think positive because these things will iron them out. Well, well, our, the issues will iron themselves out somehow. And, uh, and we don't know exactly how that will be because we still have no agreement on the table. But we are confident that in one way or another, and also as you said, Tom, there will be an agreement at some point. And um, even if there's no agreement, there will be an agreement at some point. That's at least the way I would like to end my brief discourse here. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions. So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much indeed. Uh... Jan, and as I say, th there will be a relationship, exactly the forum that we will have. We, let's see what that, what that will be. And thanks for sharing the view, which I fully, what I share with you, that it is a truly global financial market. And even despite trade agreements or, e or even uh, with no agreements, there is a global market for finance and that, that, that will continue uh, from that viewpoint. And I also, just from a personal viewpoint, the only thing that really annoys me is my after being a 40 years as a member of a British bank, I've just had my bank account closed uh, there, which stops me able to look after my finances in the UK uh, from my British account, which really pisses me off, to be honest. Anyway, uh, there, but that's another issue uh, there uh, with it. But if I look also, I think what you are saying on the chamber is very important in increasing membership uh, there because people are, are searching for clarity, for information, for knowledge, to be able to do things here and to help them grow and develop the business. And the clear recognition that Nicholas said, the ambassador said, and you said, UK is a very, very large market there uh, with it. Uh, and, and, and the relationship between UK and, and Europe and Sweden will change, but it will exist and there's an opportunity for it to grow and develop. So we should look at change as an opportunity to develop going forward. With that, let me say a few words, just a few words from an industrial viewpoint, um, as I'm involved in a number of industrial companies. I mean, clearly, like Nicholas mentioned, we've been preparing for that in, in the companies, preparing for change. Exactly what the change will be, we don't know, but it will be changed there. Um, many things looking at our systems, looking at our ways of operation. In the short term, we have been like the shoppers in London uh, that Nicholas mentioned. We have stocked up in our operations in the UK with in component inventory to enable us to be able to continue production, being un unsure exactly what will happen regarding the ease of moving things through ports, etc. Because the, even if things are well prepared, when you implement new procedures, it has implications there. So we've stocked up in component inventory and in, 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 in finished goods inventory, both in the UK and in Europe, to be able to serve customers or manufacturing in the UK um, uh, and, and our customers in the UK from products that are made in Europe and vice versa. They, so have UK made products stocked in Europe to be able to service our customers there. In addition, we have over the last few years looked uh, and been looking at our manufacturing footprint, our supply chain, to have security of supply uh, going forward uh, there. So um, uh, duplicating production facilities, both within the EU and, and in, in, in the UK. So that, I think, is a normal approach to safeguard your business and to build flexibility into your supply chain, into your manufacturing processes to be able to to, um, to work with your customers. Clearly at the moment, from us, we, we are like everyone, we lack clarity. We lack clarity in, in so many different areas. Um, even if I do not think, even towards a, a, a no deal, that tariffs will be significant, 
there will be potentially tariffs on things that could Im Im impact businesses. We do not know if certain quotas will be in, put in place. We do not know the rules for country of origin and how that will be done, especially when you have an integrated manufacturing. And I think that's where it becomes more complicated. You see it first and foremost in the car industry, but you see it in other industries where you utilize your facilities across Europe as if it's one country. That can become a little bit more complicated with rules of origin. What do you what do you mark the products, etc. There, so there's things like that, that that are concerns for us, which can um, impact our businesses. Not in the short term, but in the medium and longer term, will there be further changes on product standards, product specification, testing, and approvals? All of these things increase costs. Uh, for for business and that cost has to be paid for uh, by someone so the more we can find a way to keep a commonality in these things the better it is and that does not impact sovereignty it is just sound economic business sense there that there can be a mechanism for this to be agreed between uh, the, 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 the EU and the UK and I think from a business viewpoint having similar standards would uh, if not exact same standards would make life a lot easier to make us move goods across the different areas and to keep strengthening our integrated manufacturing area there um, uh, with it so so once we get clarity on some of these things they could have other implications on our on our um, footprint on our supply chain and our work with suppliers but one thing won't change, I'm sure, for all of us in industry, and that is the UK is a very, very important market for international companies, and UK suppliers are important for us in our European operations. We just need to find a new way of working uh, going forward. I think what's important for everyone to understand is that, yes, there's a change in relationship, but it's not Armageddon we're facing. It's a change in relationships. Uh, yeah, that is, is what it's be, and if we get more clarity in that, I th the sooner than the, the, the better. I do believe, and I share um, uh, the comments of the ambassador and, and, and Nicholas. The start of next year will be very difficult. There, it will be difficult for us in industry from a combination of two factors. One, because we are still trying to overcome COVID, and and what does that really mean there? And secondly, trying to find this new way of working. The, the thing is, those who support this movement and the change that's taking place will um, will point many things that's to do with COVID, and those that don't will blame Brexit. Reality is it doesn't matter what's to blame. The reality is we've got to make the best out of it in industry and, 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 and look forward with this and look forward to strengthen the relationship. I see this as an opportunity for Sweden with its long relationship with the UK for Swedish industry, for Swedish business to strengthen its position in the UK. I see it's also an opportunity for UK businesses to strengthen their position in, in Sweden as well. With that, I'm going to stop the introductions and I know we've got a few questions. I'd like to go back while I'm checking the questions I see here to Nicholas and my comment, my question I gave right at the end, just to give the clarity, are we ready in both sides of the pond uh, to be able to, uh, to, to implement things after the the things happen with Brexit because I would say one thing and I think the ambassador mentioned it if I'm critical of one thing in Sweden I think Sweden's been very slow at implementing things for British residents in Sweden compared to how fast UK moved for 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 getting settled status for EU nationals in in the UK but are we in, are we in good shape uh, in both sides Nicholas so I would say we are, but unfortunately in different ways. So they are not really merged, the, the different plan Bs between, let's say, the EU states and UK. So their plan Bs are different, which means it's very interesting if plan A doesn't work, then all of a sudden we have different plan Bs from different countries. And my experience is the one that is really well prepared, it's the Dutch custom they've been training for one and a half year and uh, having exactly the same 
procedures and systems one and a half year back and just improve it on a daily basis and train, train, train. And, and I must say that's a template for everybody. So uh, unfortunately, there is not even a EU standard after this one. Uh, and I think this is a pure view of how we see the society is working that, mm, well, we haven't seen so much about EU during the COVID. And unfortunately, I don't see the solutions after Brexit from an EU context um, when it's coming to the preparedness of customs. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm still hoping, yes, absolutely. And I think that's a very true uh, that what I see as well is that there's a lot of emphasis, is Britain ready, is UK ready, but yeah. not enough emphasis, are we really ready in the EU? That's just why I raise the question yeah. um, uh, to you uh, there. Um, question, and I maybe put this up, uh, and I'll, I'll start maybe to, to the uh, ambassador, a question we got in from Giancarlo, uh, Giancarlo de Gea. In, in volume terms, do you, how do you see, do you expect a significant decrease in the trade between UK and Sweden or, or is it an opportunity for the increase? What do you think? I mean, I think in the immediate term, uh, my sense is um, uh, possibly a decrease. We've already, uh, and I, I think others will know on this panel perhaps better than I, we have already seen a decrease uh, in trade this year in certain areas. Uh, largely more, we think, to do with COVID, uh, actually, uh, uh, than uh, to do with uh, Brexit. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, my sense is in the short term, there will be some very, uh, depending on what the outcome is uh, over the next 24, 48, 72, uh, and so on hours, um, there will be a short term impact. But I think longer term, um, I, I, I'm quite bullish about this. And, and I think, um, you know, Jan is, is completely right. We are still seeing a huge interest in trade and investment with the UK. Um, if I look at uh, the foreign direct investment that we've had into the UK uh, this year, it's been quite astoundingly good considering the circumstances and the context, uh, actually. Uh, and, you know, what we are seeing is a British government that is very keen going forwards to attract partnerships and internal investment into our infrastructure, particularly green technologies. Um, there is a huge opportunity there, uh, science, uh, mobility, AI, and so on. So I think the areas where Sweden has real strengths actually plays very much uh, to where the UK is looking uh, to lead its economy. Uh, so my sense is, you know, yes, we've already seen an impact this year, but I would say it's very hard to work out what is COVID uh, and what is nervousness uh, about EU exit. I tend more towards the, the impact of COVID. Uh, I suspect that will continue, but I, I do expect it to recover. I, I must uh, share your view on that, uh, uh, Judith, that, that COVID has, has a big impact of it. Uh, uh, there. I think we and need not to just with the UK, much... the whole of the no, EU, but if you look at Sweden's the... exports, you, know, you, you can see it, it is not just the UK. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the real implications of, of, of how the trade agreement will be and how the impact of that will not be during the first half of next year. It will be the longer term implications as we go out of 21, 22, 23 that we'll see that. There. And it's up to us, I think, as businesses to, to look at this as opportunities i.e. The, 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 there's an opportunity to strengthen the links between UK and Sweden. And we should be grasping that before other countries do, uh, from that viewpoint uh, there. Um, while, you're, while you're on there and, and, and unmuted, a question which I've got in here from Jakob Perra. What will be the consequences for airlines operating between the UK and uh, EU? Uh, what, what changes do you think will happen there? I mean, I think those are the details that we're still trying to work out at the moment. Um, but I think what I would say is, you know, maintaining vital connectivity between the EU and the UK is in everybody's interest. Uh, right. So again, I tend to the pragmatic view on that, um, that uh, we will find a, a workable solution all round, uh, regardless of whether we have a deal or not. Um, we all need connectivity. Uh, and again, uh, that's an industry that has been severely affected as we know uh, this year. Uh, but the fact is, you know, regardless of whether people are flying or not, freight still is. Um, yes. Obviously, no disrespect to Stena, um, they have an alternative um, <laughs> option as well, which is a lot greener, but you know, it, it is in everybody's interest to maintain that connectivity and that's what people will work towards. Absolutely, absolutely. Question here from Gary Parker. Is there a chance 
that the UK House of Commons would vote against a no deal, i.e. a rebellion against the government? And, and, and how do you see the approval process working? Well, uh, I mean, if there's no deal, um, that's not going to be brought to Parliament. It's a deal that would be brought to Parliament to be voted on. Uh, so if there is no deal reached, uh, there is nothing that is brought before Parliament uh, because there's nothing written down to agree on. We continue uh, on the terms that have already been uh, set out uh, and that will happen by default. Um, if we have a deal, um, then that is where it gets extremely interesting, uh, both in terms of the UK Parliament and the European Parliament uh, an agreement has to be ratified on both sides. Um, there are various scenarios whereby it could be done. Uh, it would stretch parliamentary procedure in, in both parliaments, um, but nothing is ever impossible. Uh, I think what that would require is pretty swift agreement because we really are um, up to uh, the, uh, you know, the limits of what is potentially possible, uh, but never say never. I think once we get to a certain place, then we have to start looking at other options in terms of how a deal is ratified. And, and I know people will be looking at that now in terms of whether there is some form of provisional application until such time as, as they're ratified. But that's not something that people are actively, you know, putting forwards now. The, the idea is to get a deal um, uh, and to be able to take that forward and ratify it. I did hear, though, today, just before I came on here, that um, uh, someone involved in the talks had tweeted out to a uh, to or, or, or sent a note out to a, to a journalist saying that that point of a provisional a agreement, a handshake agreement, could well be what they need to do just to give to go through the the ratification uh, process to say we will implement it from first of January, even if it takes a few couple of weeks into the new year to ratify it. So, which I think is a positive sign. It's a positive sign that things must be moving in the right way, and uh, and they're not going to be roadblocked into the fact that if we don't get it done this week, we won't be able to get the agreement through the legal process, etc. But let's see, this is all speculation. And there's so many rumours going about and so many people who say they're in the know uh, there with it there. Let me try to click up uh, some other questions. We have a few other questions coming up there. Um, Sticking with no deal, if I could go on there, it says, in the event of a no deal outcome, this is from Ian Richardson, in the event of a no deal outcome, what likely, oi, that's just moved. It's just moved. What likely political uh, implications would there be in that or retaliation, et cetera, would there be in that? It just, this, it was there and then it disappeared. That was a question. You know, if, if there is a no deal, do we see any um, um, political ramifications from an, a, a no deal was the question. Is that to anybody in particular? No, or? to you, of course. Got to give that <laughs> one to you. You, you. you can handle the political. Play. I was going to say, I think Jan Olsen's probably closer to that um, I will give you, I'll give than you I am in some ways. As well. um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to answer that question uh, at the moment because the idea is that we all want to deal. Um, obviously, in the event that we don't get one, um, then there will be an analysis after the fact, but I think it's very hard to prejudge that uh, or to, or to preempt that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what we want to try and focus on is the getting of a deal um, mm. uh, and uh, as soon as we possibly can. But uh, okay. uh, maybe Jan, yeah, who's outside yeah, yeah, of the British yeah, government, can comment there, more than I can. Bit, uh, Judith, I can definitely add. From a financial markets perspective, as you all know, the pound, of, of course, is very volatile at the moment. But as soon as there's a little bit of good news, as there has been over the past few hours, the pound has increased quite substantially as we've been speaking here over the past few hours. And um, so financial markets very much want a deal. Nobody believes that a deal will solve everything. It will basically be an umbrella to continue discussions in detail in the future, for example, all the issues for, for the financial markets or for the airline industry, as we're discussing here, or transportation more generally, as Stena here said, uh, Niklas from Stena said, it, it will not be solved with a agreement here. It's basically the umbrella to continue the discussions in a benign environment, and that's what we want. So some, the financial markets want to see some sort of umbrella deal, whatever it is, but some positive news that both sides have agreed to find a solution in the long run. That's, I think, the best we can hope for here. Okay, good. Uh, maybe stay uh, with you, Jan, because you've got a good view with your Swedish 
chamber role as well. What industries do you like, think are more likely, this is from Frederick Bjorkman, what industries do you think are more likely to be affected by the trade agreement? I, I think, of course, um, transportation is one sector that will be affected because um, shipping people and goods through ports, airports and so on, that will be affected. But there are many sectors that will not be that affected. In my opinion, big business will be less affected than more, the more modest type of companies because uh, nowadays the large companies and the large financial institutions, they can shift talent and um, individuals and products and production facilities not easily, but there is a possibility to shift around and move in other directions. So my view is if um, there is a, let's say the worst case scenario for a large company, of course, that's um, terrible news and so on. But in the sort of medium term, they will just shift around individuals or products and manufacturing. And I'm making it sound more simple than it is, but it is actually the way it will work. And for a more modest sized company that doesn't have those means, a no deal will of course be a much worse outcome because there are not those um, production facilities in other countries or other regions. There's not the same type of talent pool that you can draw on and sort of in different geographies. And so in my view, the only right solution is here to find some sort of umbrella deal and then move on. And that would be best for all of us. That's my view. I fully agree, Jan. I think, uh, as I said earlier, I don't think there's very few people who support a no deal. People want to see the majority of business by far want to see a deal in the, the, this there. One industry that will be impacted clearly by this, uh, and we need to see the long term implications of that is the car industry, crystal clear, mm -hmm. because it is such an integrated European supply chain. Uh, there, so it, it definitely will be impacted there. And even with recent investments by certain companies like Nissan of strengthening their manufacturing in the UK, I still believe that it's to be seen uh, how that will have an implication on the European supply chain in total going forward. Short term, it, it would be more a case of um, lengthening lead times, maybe tying up more capital, etc., in it. Uh, but medium and long term, it may be that there will be movement of production. And that could go both ways, but there will definitely could be movement of production. And I do know some of the car companies have chartered aircraft, sorry, Nicholas, but have chartered aircraft to be able to keep their supply lane uh, uh, channels going, uh, going forward into in through the first start of uh, 2021, just to have security uh, of supply. Let's see what happens um, uh, to that going forward. Um, what do we think has led UK to, as a question from Adam, Adam Javston, Strom, what do we think has led to the UK and Sweden having such a, a close bond in, in, in the past uh, uh, there? Uh, Emil, you want to, I just I would like to answer this question live, it said. Do you want? I saw Emil no. put a note there. No, okay. We, what we what, what do you ahead. think is, sorry? You can go ahead with the panel. Sorry about that, Tom. Okay, so so no, sorry, that. sorry, I'm not there. Okay, what do you think is that, uh, Nicholas? Maybe because you're such a strong um, presence in the UK, and to make sure you can uh, uh, not just sit there and enjoy the discussion. Come on a little bit. What do you think? I mean, between Sweden and the UK has 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 meant that we have such a strong bond between the two. What do you see in your business that, that emphasizes that? Well, I see that this is a very historical uh, close bonds. I mean, Tom, both you and I usually spend a lot of time in Gothenburg and I was actually the, the UK citizens building up Gothenburg from, from the iron monopoly. And I think we have some, some kind of uh, old traditions, understanding each cultures and a little bit easier also for Swedes potentially because of the language. And it's easier to step into that kind of, of market compared to potentially German or, or France if you don't know the language. And, and I mean, despite the um, potentially the sometimes overkill administration or the regulations, I think it's easier for Swedes to, to do uh, trade deals with, with UK. From our perspective, I think 
is not so much because of tradition. I think it's because of that there is business. I mean, there is 70 million plus uh, in the area. And of course that is of interest. Uh, we also see that, um, and sorry, I just have to pick up one thing from your previous question as well, Tom, regarding this about um, people and goods going over the borders. It's always been a lot of access to each other, both from aircrafts and, and ferry routes and easy to connect to. But I think the challenge here when it's coming to the Brexit part, it's absolutely not when it's coming to passengers. I mean, we've been practicing for a couple of years because there are no Schengen. So we've been doing this trial and error from a, 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 um, a tourism or transportation for, for a consumer perspective for many years. And, um, and, and also the totally collapse of closing down countries means that we during the COVID has also practicing on reduced number of passengers. So that is not really the challenge for us. The challenge for us is to get the people back again. And uh, I think the major challenge is from a business perspective when it is coming for, for freight flows, um, supply chain, as you mentioned yourself as well. And um, I mean, Sweden has such a big uh, really hard manufacturing culture, which we also have something in common when it's coming to the UK history as well, changing over time. But there are there are parts in our behavior, both in history and in the future, which is very common, I would say. And and from a Stena perspective, it's not only Stena line. We have Stena drilling, and our kitchen manufacturer Ballingslöv is there as well. And and we have a number of different businesses in UK because it's, it's, it's easy to do business with. That would yeah. be my frank answer. Jan, do you want to add anything to that from, yeah. from, yes. from your perspective? Yeah, yeah. I can uh, sort of see it from a business perspective in the type of transactions that I've been involved in and now talks of M&A and financing transactions. And um, the UK has always been the premier market in terms of that in Europe. And, Sweden being such an international country has always aligned with the UK in many of the views on regulation, like when these things come up in Brussels. I know that um, my business partners also from industry and so on have always tend to align, I mean my Swedish business partners, with the UK politicians when something came up in Brussels and maybe slightly having a slightly different view than maybe um, the main EU framework. That's maybe the way I would phrase it, to be careful here. But there's always been a view, um, if we take about liberal markets, regulation and so on, there has been a view maybe from Sweden and the UK in certain areas of financial regulation, M&A, antitrust, maybe to be a little bit more liberal and let the market decide whereas some Euro bureaucrats would see it slightly different. And Tom, we have been involved a few times over the years also in antitrust discussions where Sweden, for example, or I take Sweden here as the example, is maybe viewed as a monolith like the US in antitrust situations. And a lot of people have disagreed with that. And the UK often tended to align with Sweden on these views. So there has been I would say a special relationship on the business side, at least vis-a-vis -vis Brussels. And now that alliance might be slightly different in the future. I think you put a very important point, which is something that we should be aware of in Sweden, is that uh, in, the, in the discussions in the EU, uh, we lose as this a, a very important partner who shares many values on business, on ways of working, on free trade, etc., mm -hmm. uh, there and a weighty partner we we, we lose in these uh, discussions uh, there, and I think that's something which is extremely important. We build relationships elsewhere, so it's not just about UK and uh, and in Swedish relations, which is very important. It's about our relations in in in, in Sweden and to the UK to the EU, which will become more challenging, I think, without the UK there as, as a partner uh, for us uh, within that. There's a, a couple of questions I want to make sure I get through. People have put up questions there. Um, what, 
what do we do about VAT and custom charges from 1st of January on both goods and services? I've seen I've seen some things on that and I've been reading up a little bit about what happens to VAT uh, and, and custom charges on, on, on 1st of January. How do they apply? How do we get it back? And I know there are differences between goods in Northern Ireland and, the, and, and, and mainland UK, etc. Does who, who wants to take that VAT question, uh, their taxes? Uh, Jan, do you know more about what will happen? Or Nicholas, you're ready. I saw you well, unmuted, so that's... You well, can I'm, take not, it. I'm not really into the details there, but the discussion we have with our freight forwarding companies is that everything should be treated as a third-party country. And, and the way we are import-export things outside Europe today should be treated equally to, to UK in the future, just to get the, the base set there. I know, unfortunately, that there are some kind of lack of clarification and delays from, from, uh, from the Swedish part, uh, because uh, Tullverket and all other authorities are not really comfort in their recommendations, because they don't really know the whole story yet. So, so I, I, I know that there are confusions, uh, but just as a, a one-liner, uh, treated as when you are importing and exporting things outside Europe to other countries, three third-party countries today. Okay. Maybe I can add there something. I think the fiscal card that goes far beyond VAT, of course, is something that the UK can um, very much use in the future. I'm not saying that it should use it, but it is a very interesting perspective that comes up here in terms of businesses because um, making the UK attractive, because the EU has lots of views on taxes and VAT and everything else. And there are a lot of countries who have other views even within the EU on that specific topic. And um, of course, um, the UK being very attractive for many businesses and many individuals and companies and financial institutions, there are ways to attract companies into or and financial institutions into the UK in the future. And the fiscal attractive business environment is, of course, something, something that is very positive. And we see what um, the Trump administration did at the beginning of their four year term in terms of fiscal policies. And that was very successful, in my opinion, to um, draw back a lot of um, capital into the United States. So um, I think that's something, an interesting card to discuss in the future for the UK. Just continuing that in the financial one, there's a good question from Eric uh, Lagerlof here, which says that uh, in your introduction, Jan, you talked about the financial market being international, which we fully, fully agree with that there and that uh, Brexit in terms of financial services isn't really of a, a big issue for London as a financial centre. And you also said on the other side that Europe is in need of a common regulatory system concerning financial services in order to compete with the USA and Asia. So Eric's question is, with that as a background, what extent do rules that regulate financial markets matter? And secondly, when you talk about Europe, do you exclude the UK? from that uh, notion that Europe needs a common regulatory system. Do you exclude the UK from that? Okay, this is of course a very long qu question and lots of- Try answers. not to, yeah, try to make yeah, it short. I will be, I'll be short, I'll be short here. Um, first of all, um, uh, the UK, I view slightly different than Europe here, that's number one. And um, in terms of the regulatory environment, what I meant by that, is to make it easier even within the EU uh, in terms of the flow of capital and goods. I mean, it is for me, and to be very specific, incredible that we haven't seen more bank mergers and sort of um, financial institutions selling products cross border. It's always been, even within the EU, it's very, very challenging to do that. Um, I'm not talking about the major sort of capital markets now, and um, m and I'm talking more the day-to-day -day business, mortgages, savings accounts, and so on. Yes, we are seeing some of that, um, uh, that there's some cross-border activity, but no way the, what it could be if it would be more open, the market. So that's a little bit what I said. And, um, and in terms of uh, competing against Asia and the US, the US, when they abolished the Glass-Steagall Act, I'm going into quite technical stuff here, 
um, then they opened the financial markets cross border in the US between states and that has made the US banks grow in size enormously and the financial markets open. So in my opinion, for Europe to compete in the financial services area, we need a regulatory framework that allows for a single market in Europe. And in my opinion, the UK should be able to play in that market too. That's my opinion here, because we need the know-how from the UK in Europe in the future. And I think that will happen in one way or another. That's, by the way, my opinion, if there is Brexit or not, uh, because I think London is such a strong um, financial center that it will continue to play a very, very important role in views and so on. And then we're seeing fintech coming and there are no, not that many borders in terms of fintech. Of course, the regulatory uh, environment is important in terms of fintech, but overall it makes it even easier for financial services to go cross border. So that's a little bit what I said. So I viewed the US as a, as a big and important country there that has opened up its financial markets. So that's a little bit the way I said and Europe has to make it easier in terms of the regulatory environment to compete. And that as you good. say, that, that, exactly. And as you said, that it would be in the interest of EU and the UK for UK to be part of that opening up regulatory yeah. environment. Yeah, okay. just to be very clear, London has to be part of the future of Europe in terms of financial services. That's my opinion. There's so much talent in London. Um, uh, Judith will know maybe more than I do, but I would say there are about a million plus workers in the financial services industry just in London, and many of them are high, highly qualified, and Europe needs that talent, and vice versa. Good. Thank you, Jan. And just staying on work, because I've got a question in from Margita Beyer, and maybe I'll put that to, to the ambassador. What will be the, and I know you talked about employees and things that's happening, or, or let's say um, Swedish citizens in the UK and vice versa. What, the question is, though, what will be the impact for international companies who have UK employees working in an EU country and then vice versa, i.e. EU people working in the UK? What will be the impact of that post EU exit and, and, and how is that being handled, I think? Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it very much depends on the individual circumstances. So for those who, for EU citizens already in the UK, and for UK citizens already in the EU, your rights are protected under the withdrawal agreement and you can apply for residency in the country in which you find yourself. So that is why we are encouraging Swedish and EU, other EU citizens in the UK who are there now to apply for settled status. It's a very simple process. Uh, and as I say, m you know, most people are granted settled status. Uh, and overseas, uh, that's what we're encouraging Brits to do. Now, going forwards, um, the arrangements that we have in place are that we will be able to visit European Union countries for 90 days out of a period of 180 uh, and vice versa um, as, as ordinary tourists without visas. Uh, and then after that, we will be treated as third countries uh, and the UK is adopting a new immigration system, which will be a points-based system similar to what we have in Australia. Now, I think the key thing to understand on all of this is that the UK is neither turning inward nor shutting the door. I think that's really important. Uh, the, U the UK has long had um, its issues with the European Union, um, uh, you know, and, and you know that is one of the reasons why you know, we are in the position that we are now. That does not mean that a country that has been going out and embracing the world and trading and sailing the high seas uh, to far-flung uh, lands is going to change that mindset overnight. I don't see that happening. Neither do I see us um, becoming, I, I think, you know, the little Englanders that I think some people see us potentially as turning into. What I think it means is a sense of having more, the government wanting to have more control over migration. So we want Swedes to come to the UK. We want them to study in the UK. We want them to work in the UK. Students, prospective students can apply for visas and come as any other third country would do. Uh, and for companies uh, that want uh, to move staff around again, that will apply in the same way as it does for, for, for other companies. I think there are a few details still to be worked out on all of this, uh, and there will be exceptions. But at the end of the day, do we want Swedes to come and work in the UK? Yes. Do we want Swedes to come and study in the UK? Yes. The process by which that happens will be different going forwards. Uh, and there will be a little bit of, a, of shaking out because that is a shift from where we've been with freedom of movement on, uh, as part of um, our membership of the European Union. 
I, I know that uh, I have two children uh, studying in the UK uh, just now, and uh, and uh, the universities because they've started already. They're in their final one's in the final year, and one's got one more year to go. And, and the universities there actually have been promoting that that they still want um, EU citizens there, uh, students there. And but secondly, also if you started your course before Brexit came into place, the the university will pay your fees. Uh, up until you finish your course at the, the university. That's so for Scotland. Much. That's for Scotland. Of course. Of course. Yes. Um, God's country. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but just to be very clear, that doesn't apply throughout the whole of the UK. No, no, but of course, yeah. because in England you pay fees. And, yeah, 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 exactly. No, but, but I was saying that from that viewpoint, though, but what I've looked upon it more is, is a case of them can not being seen to put barriers up. And, and actually continuing to promote people at a time with a lot of uncertainty, promote people to, to, to come in. I, mean, I think there are two important points that come off the back of that. One is um, students that are already in the UK that are not British should apply for settled status now. Um, and I think there are quite a few, I mean, I've been a student, I, I, you know, I know what it's like, you don't always follow what you need to do, but that will give students um, the certainty that they need to continue their studies, not require visas and gives them options going forwards. Um, I, I think, you know, the other thing to bear in mind is the UK has one of the largest foreign student populations of any country in the world. Um, you know, this is not a country shutting its door. That is a significant contribution to our economy. Uh, so do we still want people from overseas coming to the UK and studying? Absolutely. Do we still want to collaborate on research and science? Yes. Look at AstraZeneca. That is a very good example of what happens when you have international scientific and academic collaboration. Um, that is a great UK Swedish success story. Um, so I think we mustn't lose sight of those positives going forwards. So absolutely. And I think also, I mean, AstraZeneca we talked, but I think also Saab has fantastic links into the UK. You handle well. There's so many companies, Stena, that have strong links. That will continue uh, going forward. I think that's important. But how it will, let, let's see in certain elements there. Um, a question here. Um, this is from um, Christine Peterson. There are comments in UK news on a systematic economic crisis where there will be a series of disasters after the transition period ends. Do we consider all possible scenarios are under control? I think we should give that to the ambassador to start with. Then we'll go to Jan. With well, let, let me talk about the history of the Swedish-UK um, relationship instead, like the other two got. No, I mean, um, let, let, let's, let's be really honest about this. Um, you know, the UK press... Um, uh, is I think particularly unique to our country and depending on which newspaper you read at the moment um, we are either heading for economic Armageddon or it is Project Fear. Um, I think you know let's be realistic uh, the reality probably lies somewhere in between. Um, are we facing a severe economic shock as a result of a global pandemic that is a once in 100 year event Yes, we are. Has our GDP contracted in an unprecedented manner this year? Yes, it has. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, this is not news to the British government. It's certainly not used to, news to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who uh, unveiled his spending review recently, which was tailored to deal with the economic uh, challenges that the UK finds itself in the moment. And we're not alone in that. I mean, the UK is not the only country facing these challenges. You know, we see the same in Sweden, uh, the US and elsewhere. So I think there's a very good understanding of what the uh, economic risks are in 2021. Um, I think if you if you want a, uh, an unbiased uh, and sensible view of where the UK economy is going, the OBR, uh, the Office of, of Budget Responsibility, is a very good place to look. Uh, and I think actually they have some quite um, sort of positive assessments in terms of how long it will take for the UK to recover from the year that has been 2020. Um, and I think that's very much uh, worth looking at. I mean, we, we've had economic shocks before. Um, the price of money is currently cheap. The price of borrowing is very cheap at the moment. I think that gives governments more options. So I, I, would, I would tend, um, as I always do, um, to be very careful about what I take from the fine um, British press, uh, and it is a fine institution, but we know 
um, that you know at the end of the day uh, the important thing is to focus um, on uh, usually the middle line uh, quite frankly uh, and I think uh, my sense is we're all economically challenged uh, but you know the British government is fully aware of the challenges uh, and the Chancellor is looking at it very carefully and taking the steps that he thinks he needs to to deal with it. And yeah, we're still, I, it's still it, one of the world's largest economies. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we can be terribly doom and gloom about it, but the UK is still a member of the G7 uh, and the world's, what, sixth largest economy at the moment. I, I need to check. That may have changed in the last hour. But, you know, flippancy aside, um, we are still a serious economic player and will continue to be so. Absolutely. And I think I uh, fully agree that with that. And uh, two factors there. One, depends which media you read, how, how things are. I mean, the media is in very different camps at the, uh, at the moment, which is normal, which is absolutely normal uh, uh, within that. And then secondly, I think it is very difficult in all areas just now to, to bring apart the two big challenges, the, the COVID situation and this impact on economies, all economies around the world, and then what will specifically be a Brexit uh, or EU exit impact, either in EU or on, on the UK. It's going to take time. To, to, to wash out uh, as, as we get the pandemic under control, as we use the vaccines to, to, to start to move back to some degree of normality. Although I heard Bill Gates talking yesterday who said normality will come in the summer of 22 uh, there, which was uh, a little bit further out than I was hoping for uh, there. But even so, it will take time for this to, 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 to sort itself uh, out with that. Jan, do you want to raise any views in your, um, how you it, see the outlook and how you yes, see things developing? Definitely, and I agree here with Judith, it's definitely an evolutionary um, sort of progression. I do not see an Armageddon here, absolutely not. There have been much worse things historically than Brexit. Brexit in the long run will be a blip and we will move on. But right now we have to face it and there will be some shocks to the system, of course. But um, what the economists never see, they take an analysis as a whole but what we have to see is that the markets adapt and individuals adapt and companies adapt, politicians adapt, the fiscal system adapts. And that's what will happen if we see a worst case scenario here. But in my view, it is a, an evolution and it will be an adapting, we'll adapt to it. So there will not be an Armageddon at all here. And um, the other thing is also the UK is part of the global economy and it's not just Europe here. So there are other countries that will continue to do business with the UK. For example, the US is a very important partner. Latin America is an important part of Asia, Africa. We name it. There are lots of other, the Commonwealth. There are lots of other situations here. And um, the UK will survive in any scenario. And that's, um, and that's normally the outcome in any of these political debates, that the economy adapts very quickly and everybody works towards a common goal and to and that is to increase the common good and um in my view that is what will happen here i would say i think uh, i share your view it, it, companies are used to adapting businesses are used to adapting to significant changes whatever may happen there and that will adapt over time uh, and how they do the supply chain how they do the manufacturing where they do what they do etc that will come and companies are very very good uh, doing that uh, uh, there. And again, as you stress, the UK is a very, very important economy. Yeah. So therefore, people are not going to walk away from the UK's economy. However, the relationship will be somewhat different in, 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 in how it's looked at. And I think the issue I've got, whilst I fully um, understand the need in this discussion on level playing field to keep um, um, the, 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 to respect the sovereignty, and the rights of, of the people to, to set their own standards, etc. That um, it is important within this that uh, the, the 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 more commonality we can have through choice, not through being forced. The more commonality we can have on product standards, testing, etc., environmental standards, etc., the better it is. I think for to reduce cost for 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 industry and to 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 influence also other parts of the world. Um, and how they address, for example, environmental issues. The other thing I would say is we must remember UK has already made significant trade deals with many other countries 
uh, around around the world. Now let's see how it goes going forward with some of the bigger economies. But uh, it's already made some fairly significant uh, uh, trade deals. That's why I think it is important to get this trade deal over the line uh, with with Europe. Uh, there, although this, as I said right at the start, this is a more challenging deal because unlike other trade deals where you're trying to come closer, we're trying to keep close, but maybe separate a little bit here, which makes it a little bit more, more challenging um, um, uh, and difficult from that side. Nicholas, do you uh, have any of you, how you see the future of the UK and how important that fits into Stena's plans going forward? You already identified it's a very important market for you, very important business. How do you see that in the coming few years? But, but it will continue being very important. I think, I mean, 43% of the UK export goes still to Europe and 51% of the import to UK comes from Europe. So, of course, there are very important um, uh, connections. And, and uh, the way we see it is that, yes, UK, they do leave EU, but they are still a part of Europe. And I think that connection is very important for us. And as we said before, there are so many people living there and the market is huge. So Europe can't live without UK and UK can't live without Europe. But, but being a part of the EU, that's another discussion. I think partly the recovery uh, after Brexit will be in some way a little bit easier than the recovery from COVID, honestly, because uh, shutting down countries and shutting down borders, that is a bigger effect and cost than we see out from the consequences from Brexit, of course. But, but from the Stena perspective, yeah, we do still believe that there will continue for the next at least 300 years be a good trade flows between UK and the rest of Europe. And therefore we continue to invest there and, and we are willing to do it even more um, because we have a very long-term perspective not potentially always 300 years, but, but, but of course, um, with the asset we are investing in, we need to believe in the future for many years ahead, both in ships and ports. And, and we still have a appetite of, of continue doing those kind of investments. Um, so it's just going to be, I think the biggest challenge for, for Stena for the moment is really not the trade between the central part of Europe in over to UK. It's actually everything that's happening on the Irish Sea with Northern Ireland, the borders between the Republic of Ireland, and then realize the consequences from, from uh, the Good Friday deal as well. So, so I think the complication, and, and that is usually not talked about, but what will be the consequences for the Republic of Ireland, who all of a sudden are stuck in some kind of backyard. And there is a kind of production over there as well that we need to understand is important, both for UK and for, for, uh, for the rest of Europe. So I think maybe in this context of the Swedish uh, UK chamber, it's more realistic to talk about the relationship between Sweden and UK. But I think the, the really big challenge for a company like Stena it's the consequences on the Irish Sea because there are so many freight flows where you go. I mean, you can go from Holland over to UK, use that as a land bridge, and then sailing over to the Republic of Ireland and you're back in Europe. And then you drive up, pick and leave in Northern Ireland and go domestic over to Scotland, for example, and then drive. So, so there are complications for the local holders there as well that would be extremely interesting to follow for us. So um, I'd gladly be here in the one year again and tell you how, how everything ended up if we know it at that time. But yeah, big challenges over there as well, just to have a wider context in the discussion here. I think it's an extremely good point you raise. And I think that's been one of the stumbling blocks up until just recently when they were able to come to some agreement how to make that operate. But even so, the long-term implications of that are not clear no. uh, there because uh, it, it, it will have significant influence. And, and the relationship between Ireland and the rest of Europe, but also between Ireland and the UK, will be, there's going to be some uh, important uh, changes in that. And, and I don't know what the ambassador says, but I think the need of some kind of standards are actually important between UK and, and EU because of the relationship between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, because 
that is where we really see the ultimate challenge there when it's coming to like yeah standards and and how we are grading uh, food and agriculture etc because mm -hmm. that needs to be equal to how the rest of eu is, is treated as well and i think it's a huge challenge mm -hmm. maybe and i can do that and, and, and go to the ambassador but add one question to that i mean clearly just now and it was very evident last uh, last week when Prime Minister Johnson went over to to Brussels to 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 talk there to the EU president uh, there that um, you're not allowed to talk to anybody but the EU president. You're not allowed to talk to the other leaders, etc. Mm -hmm. Once once this deal is over, the the finishing line, which it will be, the one way, shape, or form, they'd be. Um, and maybe it is to the more to the ambassador. How do you see? I mean, how will that move forward? Do you think countries like Sweden will be able to make bilateral deals, or will we get? Will there be a view from the EU of saying, hey, "Sorry, we we have to be one face to the to the to the UK even going forward"? Uh, it's important for us in how we develop the Swedish UK uh, relationship post. Uh, uh, the implementation uh, in, in 1st of January. What's, what's your feeling, Ambassador Judith? Can we see the the possibility for UK and Sweden to form a closer bond, or would you think you could have some imp uh, impact on that? Um, I, I think it depends on where, on what subject we're talking about, because it will all boil down to EU competence. Uh, and the reason uh, that we are engaged directly with the Commission and not individual EU member states is because trade is uh, a Commission competence uh, and will continue. So I think um, there are some practical um, things whereby, you know, I, I suspect there will be a period of, of a bit of a pause and an assessment of where we've got to uh, mm. and needing to implement uh, where we have got to. I mean, we, we're going to be in a, in a phase in the first quarter of 2021 of implementing whatever it is we've got. And that, it, you know, regardless of the outcome is a significant shift and change. So we need to get through that period. Um, and, and then it will boil down to a question of competence in terms of what what do individual countries within the European Union have the competency to agree or have the competence to agree uh, with a third country? Uh, and again, I think that is what we will need to look at uh, going forwards. It doesn't stop us reaching agreements or signing memoranda of understanding uh, with either Sweden or companies. Uh, in fact, I can see um, quite a bit of activity in a number of areas. I mean, if you look at defence in particular, um, you know, there are clear areas where I think we will continue to thicken and develop that relationship very much helped by Saab choosing to invest heavily in the UK this year which is a huge positive um, so my, my sense is there will be scope going forwards but obviously we have to understand where the competence lies uh, and what individual states are able to do and then what we have in our mutual national in interests uh, and, and that's going to be key but you know uh, I think, you know, we will obviously want to be engaging with Sweden. You're, I mean, we were talking earlier about what binds us together. You know, we live in the same neighbourhood. We're very like-minded on the challenges out there. Um, we, we started to talk into history. I have a book on my desk that talks about the lives and livelihoods in Little London, the story of the British in Gothenburg from 1621. This goes back a long way. Yes. Um, we have a Protestant ethic, both countries. There's a lot that binds us culturally. That isn't changing overnight because the UK has left the European Union. Um, so there, I, for me, the fundamentals, uh, the foundations are very solid. Um, inevitably, there will be a little pause and hiatus as we deal with uh, the, the, the implementation period and the uh, ramifications. But as I say, I'm positive going forward that there is a lot that we can work on together. And what an excellent tone to and comment to finish the, the, the session on. The hour and a half has gone very fast. I want to take the opportunity to thank you, Judith. Thank you, uh, Nicholas. Thank you, Jan, for excellent insights into this. Uh, it is a, a positive message, I think, as, I, as we've said right from the start, there is life after 1st of January uh, for the relationship between the UK, the EU, the UK and Sweden. We have a long history there. there. We need to see what shape that will take, at least in the short term. But I am positive that we, we have to live in the reality. Brexit has been agreed and, and there will be a different relationship. Now let's see how we can turn that relationship to our advantage between UK and Sweden. 
And with the long history we've got, I see there's great opportunities uh, to do that. So thank you to each of you. Christina, can I pass back to you, uh, please, to, to maybe just close it up at realising we're spot on time, I think. Yes, we are spot on time. Thank you so much to our distinguished panel. Thank you for your very valuable contribution to this important and challenging um, discussion. I will bring with me opportunities uh, to see opportunities out of this to strengthen the relationship between Sweden and the UK and how we all work towards common good. Thank you all for your questions, both from the attendees in Sweden and in the UK and in Finland. And we hope to continue working closely together with uh, also the embassy, the SEC and other chambers of commerce and with all of our members to keep building this platform and community for and behalf of our members and um, for the trading relationship between Sweden and the UK also in the future. I really hope to see you all at our upcoming events. If I don't see you before, I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very nice and relaxing, hopefully, Christmas. Thank you all for listening and thank you to the panel. Thank, thank you. you so much. Merry Christmas, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Merry thank Christmas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.